All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it, it's a beautiful day outside, and uh, and I tell you what, let me let me write her, make sure we're on, since she's not here to check this. Anyway, I hope it stays this way. Man, it's so nice outside. It's probably one. It's going to get cold again and damp and rainy. It's going to snow. Yeah, if it snows, it kind of messes up. Let's ask God's blessing. We're going to get into this message today. Father, thank you for, for those who are here today and those who will be watching online today. We ask your anointing and your blessing on this, on this message and help people to really take this to heart. Help us all to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be talking about how strict is God about our worship. Most people say, well, uh, I worship God in the way that I think I should, and I'm sincere, and all you have to do is be sincere, because it doesn't really matter what you believe or how you worship as long as you're sincere. Really? Well, you know, if sincerity makes it right, then Adolf Hitler was right. Because he was very sincere. Exodus 23. Let's go to Exodus 23 if you got your Bibles. And uh, let's see here. We're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to show you some interesting things today. This, you know, a lot of sermons just bore people to pieces. And I don't think this one will because I hope none of my sermons bore it for you. But you know, you've heard, you've been in churches where the guy gets up and he reads every single word he says. And uh, people fall asleep for sure. But I don't think you will if you really pay attention to this because I think you'll learn something that will be enlightening to you. Chapter 23 and uh, verse 24. One verse. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. What verse is that? Verse 24. Okay. Chapter 23, verse 24. Don't do after their works. Utterly overthrow them quite quite, which means totally break down their images and so on. And you shall serve the Lord your God. And so people say, well, it really doesn't matter if I do after their works as long as I Christianize it. Uh, but is, is that really what the Bible says? Let's go to Leviticus 18. We're just going, we're going to have a Bible study today where I'm going to just show you what God's word says about worship and how strict he is. And, and what got me interested in this was uh, looking at how David was trying to do the right thing, and David's heart was right, and he was praising God, and leaping and dancing and all these things, and a man died because his worship wasn't by the letter. Now let's take a look at Leviticus 18 and verse 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, past tense, shall you not do. Well, they took part of Egypt with them when they came out. They still have that in their mind. After the doings of the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. That word can also be translated customs. In fact, look at verse 30. Therefore shall you keep my ordinances, my ordinance, my laws, that you may that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. Same Hebrew word. Same word. Don't commit their abominable customs. Now, here's what Israel eventually did. Are you going to go back to these scriptures? No. On 23, 24, uh -huh. quite break down their images? Yeah. That means totally. Totally break them down. Destroy them. Destroy them, yeah. Like the word quite and the word quit. Like yeah, it, yeah, yeah, but I, what I'm saying is, so he, he, that's what he orders for. Yeah, absolutely. That's what he told them to do. Just get rid of it totally, completely. We can't do that these days. <clears throat> you know, and the Catholic Church absorbed all that paganism brought into the church. Yeah, okay. We'll find this interesting. I think you'll find this message very interesting today. That's how most they know the difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chapter uh, 20 and verse 23 of Leviticus. Chapter 20 and verse 23. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Don't you be like the heathen. Be ye not like unto them, Jesus said. Don't be like the heathen. Yeah, but it's okay as long as you put Christ's name on it. Uh -uh. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to turn to, uh, let's see here. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Two books over. Deuteronomy. We're in that now in our second year in our bachelor's class. 
Deuteronomy is one of the best books in the Old Testament. It's really interesting, and it tells us how to live. Do you know there's even a scripture in the, in the, in the book of Deuteronomy that tells you how to go to the bathroom? Yeah, there's all kinds of instruction. Chapter 4 and verse 2, you shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish, that means subtract, alt from it. Alt means anything. If Don't add, don't subtract, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. If you add to it, you won't be keeping his commandments. If you subtract to it, you're not going to be keeping God's commandments. I had a team of people working under me, and I can't remember which company it was now, some years back now. And these fellows asked me for permission to add a certain thing to what they were doing. And I said, no, because you won't have time to do that. Oh, please let us do it. Please let us do it. Well, I was their team leader. And I finally acquiesced, and I said, okay, go ahead, and I'll let you do that, but make sure you get your other work done. Well, weeks went by, and I noticed they weren't getting their required work done. And I got on to them about it, and I said, you didn't do what, I, what you're supposed to be doing. And one guy said, well, we don't have time to do that now because we're doing this other stuff. Ooh, that got all over me. They weren't supposed to be doing that other stuff anyway. I gave them permission, but what happened was when they started doing what they wanted to do, they gave up what they were required to do. Boy, I, to this day, I remember how angry I was about that. All the time. Yeah. So when they say, well, can't we just please do this? Can't we add this? Well, I told you to do this. Yeah, yeah, so, and, and you know how it is, because you, yeah. you, you have a team of men working under you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And that didn't set well with me at all. Chapter, tw chapter 6. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> and that guy, he said it with such an attitude. Well, we don't have time to do that now because we're doing this. Oh, chapter 6, verse 25. Here's what, here's what God tells us. It shall, now this is Moses saying this under inspiration of God. It shall be our stat. Well, let's go back up to verse 24. Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 24. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord, our God, for our good. It's for our good, always, that he might preserve us alive as it, as it is this day. And verse 25, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord, our God. Now, notice this. As... He commanded us. Don't take the Ten Commandments and tweak it a little bit to suit yourself. Don't do that. Or leave them out. Or leave one out, the ones you don't like. <clears throat> As he commanded us. Look at chapter 12 now of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Starting in verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods, their temples. Destroy them. Now, the early Catholic Church obeyed that, the early Catholic Church. But then eventually one of the popes said, well, you know, some of these temples are well built. Why don't we just sprinkle some holy water on it and we'll move our people into it and call it a church? That's why that you have such funny architecture on modern-day churches today because they, they resemble the ancient pagan temples of Europe. Destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, and break their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. Now listen to verse 4. You shall not do so to the Lord your God. Don't use their temples to worship God. Don't use their altars to worship God. Don't use their groves to worship God. Don't use their customs. We saw the word custom back there in Leviticus. Don't use their customs to worship God. Verse 9, <clears throat> is it verse 9? Let's see, look at my notes here. Oh, verse 30, go to verse 30. Uh, Take heed to yourself that thou be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before you, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so, I'll do likewise. Now, that could mean two things. One thing it could mean is, How did they serve their gods? I'll do likewise and serve their gods. Or it could mean, how did they serve their gods? I'll do likewise to my God. Now, we, don't, we can't interpret it. We're not allowed to interpret it. But God interprets it in the very next verse. Thou shalt not do so to the Lord thy God. So that's what God is talking about. Don't inquire after their gods saying, how, and I put a very dark underline under the word how, how did these nations serve their gods? I'll do likewise to the Lord my God. Now, <clears throat> Buddha's birthday is celebrated 
by the priests and by the people. It was a very interesting celebration. I learned this when I saw a temple up in Manassas, Virginia, and it said Buddhist temple, and I'd never seen one before, so I drove over there and looked at it. And right in the front door, there's a thing there. They were advertising Buddha's birthday called the Wiesak Festival. And you know how they celebrate his birthday? They take their priests and throw them in the mud. So let me reiterate what God said. Thou shalt not do so to God's ministers. Don't worship God the same way you worship Buddha. Because <clears throat> I don't want to. Don't want you to follow Buddha's customs. Did you yeah, have a question? Yeah, I was in a customer's house yesterday. I walked upstairs from down to the basement. I got ready to go out the front door to leave. And I looked over to the right. There was this huge, biggest Buddha I've ever seen on a stand in their living room. I said, oh, so y'all are Buddhists. She said, no, my mama just thought that would look good up on my thing. I said, well, she wouldn't think it would look good up on there if she knew what it meant. Yeah. And, but sidebar, there is a Buddhist organization temple right in my very neighborhood as you come in. Huge, I mean. Yeah. When I was a kid, you never saw anything like that. No, you know. Yeah. But, but nowadays, one of these days, we'll probably have a mosque here in Kannapolis. Yeah, may already have one in Charlotte. I don't know. <clears throat> so God said, don't inquire saying, how did they serve their gods? I'll do likewise to the Lord my God. Don't do that for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, have they done to their gods. Now, verse 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish from it. Now I learned this as a child. My daddy would tell me to do something. Well, yeah, but I thought it'd be okay to do it this way. What did I tell you to do? Oh, yeah, you said do such and such. All of you got that from your fathers, you know. What, what did I tell you to do? Oh, yeah, okay, well. Why didn't you do what I told you to do? Well, I thought, well, that's what you get for thinking. I've heard that over and over. Yes, sir. My father didn't say anything. <laughs> I taught you, yeah. <laughs> And in, and in school, when you're in grade school, you know, the teacher will um, say something. and I told you to do this. Well, yeah, but I thought. See? I, yeah, but I thought. And so God tells us, you do what I said, don't you add, don't you subtract. You just do what I said to do. And you'll be okay. Chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> now we come to verse 9. <clears throat> verse 9 says... When you are coming to the land, he's talking to ancient Israel who were about to enter the promised land, which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Don't do after their abominations. There shall not be found among you any that, pass, that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times like astrology, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits. That's that's called spirit guides nowadays. A wizard or a necromancer. That's someone who communicates with the dead. And I've seen them on television where they have this blonde-haired lady and they bring her on stage and she communicates with dead people. And, uh, you know, she's one of, the, <clears throat> one of the biggest, most famous mediums. I can't remember her name now. But when I see her face, I always recognize it. So God said, don't do that. Now let's take a look at the book of Judges. You know what I've found being in the college here for just a few months that I've been in here about the word. What's that? God covers everything. Yeah. It, it's everything. A, like it, God does cover everything. Like I said, he even tells you how to go to the bathroom. With the everything. Bible. I yeah. mean, the Bible, yeah. Now, Judges chapter 17. <coughs> I want to show you something here. <coughs> Verse 1. There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. Verse 2, this is Judges 17. He, he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which you cursed, spoke also in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it, and his mother said, Blessed be thou, the Lord my son. And when he had restored, he stole from his mother, and his conscience bothered him, so he gave it back. He restored the 1,100 shekels of silver, and his mother said, Now listen to this. I had wholly dedicated the silver to the Lord. Well, isn't that wonderful? That's a good thing. From my hand for my son, but now listen, to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, will I restore it to you. So yet, he restored the money into his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. Now, do you see what the problem is? 
I want to dedicate this to the Lord, you see. Think about that. I had wholly dedicated the silver to the Lord to make a graven image. I'm going to worship God with an idol, which is the very thing he told me not to do. Now, verse 5, and the, and the man Micah had a house of gods. Now, the Jewish translation words it this way. The man Micah had a house of God. It's the same word, translated God. That's how the Jewish translation reads. The man Micah had a house of God. So he set up his own little church building. And he puts graven images and idols in there. Yeah, verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. Now listen to this, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's exactly right. Oh, I'm worshiping God. I do it my way. Yeah. These two guys were talking one time, and one of them said, uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> they were disagreeing. He said, well. The words to that song. Mm -hmm. Have you ever really looked at the words to that song? I did it my way. Oh, yeah. Frank Sinatra's song. Yeah. I haven't really paid attention to it. You also pay attention to it one time and you're really, your eyes will be open. Oh, okay. I have to do that. I was thinking about that when I was yeah, preparing the sermon. Bad. I have to listen to it. Um, these two men were arguing over the Bible. And finally, one said to the other, Well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. You'll have to worship God in, in your way and I'll worship God in his. <laughs> I'm doing it right. But here, every man did it in his own eyes, what he thought was right in his own eyes. Let's go to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go to uh, Jeremiah. Is that right? No, I'm wrong. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now, let's get into something very interesting here. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 6. The Philistines have captured the Ark of the Covenant. And um, they wanted to get rid of it because disease broke out on them. And so they said, let's send it back to Israel. And uh, so I won't go into all the detail. But verse 6, 1 Samuel 6 and, uh, and verse 6 says, They ask, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among the people, meaning he did wonders. Verse 7, now therefore make a new cart. And take two milk kind, that means milk cows, on which there has come no yoke. Now notice they're showing respect to the God of Israel, where there's no yoke. And, and tie the, the cows to the cart and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart. Now they got a real nice cart to put the ark of God on. They're showing respect to God. And put the jewels of gold in, uh, which you return him for a trespass offering. So they're even giving an offering to God on the side thereof and send it away that it may go. So their idea was, let's send the ark back to Israel. We'll put it on a nice new cart and these milk cows that never had a yoke on them. So we'll send the ark back. Now, they're showing respect to God. Now, the Philistines were not in covenant with God, and that was the best they knew how to do. This is how they determined to honor God, and they were very sincere. Now, that's 1 Samuel 6. Now, let's go to 2 Samuel 6. David wanted to bring the ark to Jerusalem, which was going to become the new capital. 2 Samuel 6, starting in verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from, the, from uh, Baal, or baal -E, that later became known as kirjath Jerim, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubim, the angels. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Now they followed the, the exact same thing the Philistines did. <clears throat> and they brought out of the house of Aminadab, and they had us in Ohio, uh, Ohio, not Ohio, to drive the cart. Now verse, um, well, verse 4, they brought it to the house of Aminadab, uh, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel, now listen to how they worship God. They played before the Lord. They're playing on the instruments. On all manner of instruments made of fir, wood, harps, psalteries, timbrels, that's comparable to tam tambourines, and on cornets and cymbals. Man, they're making a joyful noise to the Lord. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Now the oxen is walking along and the ark begins to tumble. It may fall out of the ground. 
What a horrible thing. If the ark had fallen on the ground, broken open, the Ten Commandments may have shattered. The holiest thing they had in the entire nation was about to fall down and maybe break up. And Uzzah, in his sincerity, grabbed the ark to steady it. Verse 7, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died. Well, didn't he know his heart? Didn't he know in his heart that what he was doing was wrong? Well, no, he, no, didn't God know his heart? Oh, God, yeah, God knew the guy's heart. The thing was about to fall, and he had to make a split decision. So he reached up and he steadied it, and God killed him on the spot. He was sincere. His heart was right, but it was wrong. It says he committed an error. Well, if he went to heaven, then it wasn't really so bad anyway. <laughs> well, here's what you got to keep in mind. Here's what you got to keep in mind. God is teaching us. Remember Paul said all scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Mm -hmm. This is for our instruction. We may be sincere, but if we commit an error in our worship, it could kill us. Yeah. Okay. That's, the, that's the instruction. That's what we're supposed to learn from this. Mm -hmm. When we say, well, I'm, but I'm sincere, God says, but you're not doing it right. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God seeks such to worship the Father, the Father is, is he's a spirit, God is a spirit, and he seeks people to worship him in spirit and in truth. They were worshiping God in spirit, playing on all these instruments, psalteries and tambourines and cornets and cymbals, making a joyful noise. Their heart was right, but they were carrying the ark on a cart. That was wrong. Numbers 4 says you got to put these staves, these rods, between the little rings on the top of the ark, and the priest would carry them on their shoulders like this. Oh, okay. See, they're not so they're not allowed to put the ark on a cart. Oh, okay. I, just, <clears throat> I, I missed that part somehow. Yeah, the priest were to. It wasn't supposed to even touch a cart or the ground. They carried it on their shoulders with these okay. rods. Okay, so David didn't know the law. So David said, "No, wait a minute. The Philistines put it on a new cart, and we'll do the same oh, thing." Yeah. We're going to do what the Philistines did. The Philistines were heathen. Yeah. Okay. See, verse 3, they set the ark of God upon a new cart, they oh, thought. Yeah. No, I didn't, it didn't hurt yeah. me. This, this way, God will be so honored. Yeah. God said no. And nobody out of all those people caught that. They didn't catch it. And David didn't catch it either. Mm -hmm. You'd think there'd be some priest around there that might have caught it. Now... <clears throat> Verse uh, 8, David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord. He said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? He didn't know. He didn't know how to get it. He didn't know how to, how to get it where he wanted it because he hadn't studied the law. So apparently, now they, they put it in this guy's house, Obed-Edom, for three months. During that time, David had a chance to study the law. Now go to 1 Chronicles, and I'll show you something. 1 Chronicles 20, 15. 1 Chronicles 15. David, in that next three months, apparently learned what he'd done wrong. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark there in the city of David in Jerusalem and pitched for it a tent. Verse 2. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. Now he had learned something. For them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark and to minister to him forever. So... Only the priests were allowed now to do that. And David gathered, verse 3, all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place or to its place, which he had prepared for it. Verse 11, and David, David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the two top priests, and for the Levites. Verse 12, and he said, you are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord of God of Israel unto the place that I prepare for it. Now, I want you to pay close attention to verse 13. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. We didn't do it the way God told us to do it. Verse 15, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God upon their shoulders, the way God said to, with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded. So where was, 
So Moses is the one that told them the proper procedure to begin yeah. with? Yeah, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. The Lord told Moses how to do it. Moses wrote it down. David forgot to look into the Bible. Oh. That's what we do today. We forget to look into the Bible. Or we just don't do it, period. Don't do it at all. Well, my grandma said this and that, and I believe her. I know she wouldn't lie. She was a good woman and all that. My Sunday school teacher is such a sweet lady. I know she wouldn't lie. No, they, they wouldn't lie, but they're deceived. You go to the word of God to find out the proper way to worship God. You don't worship God the way you want to do it. Some years ago, back when I was in my 20s, I had grown up in a very formal church, United Methodist Church. <clears throat> and I would visited some other churches, including the Episcopal Church. And I came up with a worship service. I said, if I ever start a church, I know how I want to do it. Well, after all the people come in and sit down and we're ready to start the service, we're going to turn out the lights. Not totally out, but just dim them really low. And then we'll have the choir to march up in the middle between the pews. And they'll be, you know, in their choir robes. And they'll be singing Martin Luther's song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. They'll do that every week to start the service. Be very, very formal. Then they'll, as they're singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, they'll walk up to the choir. And then we'll, and I forget all the rest of the ritual. I had come up with all this ritual. And one day I was reading in the Psalms where it says, uh, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and, and worship the Lord. And I thought, not in my church. <laughs> my church is too formal for that. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. My church must be wrong. The kind of church I wanted to start does not allow for people to raise their hands and worship God. I said, well, maybe i got to tweak that a little bit and get it back to God's way of doing things. And then I read one day where it says, clap your hands in the sanctuary. And I said, oh, no, we can't do that. Not in a formal service that I've come up with. And then I read in Psalm 150, it says, dance before the Lord. And I said, well, that does it. I had to scrap my entire <laughs> service that I've come up with. And I was sincere. And I thought, this wonderful, see, my dad grew up Lutheran. He would have come to that church. He'd said, this is the most beautiful worship service I've ever attended. My dad would have thought it was great. But my heavenly father wouldn't have liked it. Because I didn't base it on his word. I based it on what, and I was only in my 20s. I based it on what I thought a service ought to be very formal because that's how I'd grown up. But I got into the word of God in Psalm 119 verse nine says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And then it gives you the answer by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You cleanse your worship. You cleanse what you're doing by taking heed to the Bible. I got in the Bible and I said, all right, it tells us to worship God, raising your hands, dancing, praising God, clapping, you know, having a good time. I said, that's what the Bible says. All right, I got to scrap my service. Mine's not right. This is right. So if we have enough people here to do it and we have some, some live music and the girls want to dance and praise God, we'll let them do it. I've been in, how many of you have ever been in a service where you've seen the people dance? You've been down there? Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a Jewish congregation down here in Charlotte, and I went down there some years ago, and they, had, they were singing some very lovely songs, lovely Jewish music, Hebrew music. And these ladies were up there, and they had a form to circle, and they were just dancing. It was just beautiful to watch. It was praising God. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. So I had to scrap my service. All right, that's what we should do with our, our worship and our doctrines and our religion. We need to scrap it all and get into the Bible and find out what the Bible tells us to do. Worship God as he's told us to worship him, not how we think that God ought to be worshipped. God knows how he wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Look at verse 25. So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom, and it came to pass that when God helped the Levites that bore the ark, God helped the Levites, <clears throat> that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams, and David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and the Levites that bore the ark, and the singers, and so and so, the, whoever, whatever, how you, however you pronounce his name, the master of the song of the singers, David also had upon him an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting. There's another thing the Bible says to do. Shout before the Lord. Praise. Yeah, praise God. <clears throat> so they were shouting before God. And uh, with the sound of the cornet, the trumpets, the cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. Man, that's how, that's how God. Now, David was called a man after God's own heart. That's how God wants you to be. He wants to be worshipped that way. Praising God, loving God. This morning I got up before six o'clock. It was dark outside, and I just and I was cold. 
And, you know, I've got a heat pump and I've got the vents in the floor. So I just walked over there and sat down on those vents to get warm. While I was sitting there, I was talking to God, praising God, thanking God for all the blessings. And the house. And that sun broke through. Yeah, about an hour later. <laughs> it was so dark in there at the time. And I just sat there and just praised God. I was, you know, I got to bed early last night. So I had a full night's sleep. And I'm just praising the Lord. That's, that's what God, God, the Bible says pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. When you have time, rather than turn on the TV set, spend some time thanking God for the things that he has done for you. Now I want to go over to, uh, to Jeremiah. No, no. But we want to be entertained. Second Kings. I know it. We do. That's how we are. We want to be entertained more than we want to spend time talking to God. Second Kings. I want to show you something. Go backwards here, a book. Second Kings chapter 17. Yeah, back, go back. Second Kings 17. Now, <clears throat> this is the time when all the ten tribes were taken into captivity. <clears throat> chapter 17. All the tribes were taken into captivity. And I won't read that. You ought to read this whole chapter sometime. It's very interesting. God tells us why he allowed the enemy to come in and take the entire, take over the whole nation of Israel, pull them out of their land, and take them to their own land as slaves. Verse 15 says, 2 Kings 17, verse 15, they rejected, they, Israel, rejected his statutes, just like America has done, and his covenant that, that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, that means his laws, which he testified against them, and they followed vanity. The Bible calls idols vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they, listen, that they, God's people, should not do like them. Be not like unto them, Jesus said. Don't be like the heathen. So they went, well, hey, you know, the heathen have a great way to worship God. Well, we worship our God the same way they do. No, wrong thing to do. Any questions at this time? Let's go to Jeremiah 10. It's right after Isaiah, Jeremiah 10. Verse 1 says, hear the word of the Lord. Churches don't do that today. It's their traditions and their customs. Well, we've always done it this way. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Verse 3, the customs of the people are vain. We don't have to learn them, we're taught them. What's that? We're not, we don't have to learn them these days, we're taught them. We've already been taught them. Yeah. Now we've got to unlearn these exactly. things. The customs are vain. He even talks about how they go out to the forest and they take a tree and they <clears throat> bring it into the house. Verse 4, they deck it with silver and gold. Wow, that sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it moved not. John Hagee was talking about this one time. He said, <clears throat> he said, don't get mad at me. He said, but that's what you did to your Christmas tree. I heard John Hagee say that. He said, you fasten it with nails so it won't fall down. I've and, done that before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a little, little red uh, platform that we used to put our tree in when I was a kid. But, so God said, don't learn their way. Oh, but, but, I, but I'm doing it for God. God said, no, don't do that. Hey, worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what is truth? It's not what my tradition tells me. It's not what my church tells me. Jesus said, John 17, 17, God's word is truth. Look at verse 16. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is, is the former of all things. Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. I wonder if I got the right verse here. No, I don't. <coughs> I meant to say go to chapter 16. I didn't think I looked right. Sorry about that. Chapter 16 of Jeremiah. Verse 19. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. Listen to this. The Gentiles, those non-Israelites people, non-Israelites like myself, the Gentiles shall come unto thee, to God, from the ends of the earth. This is going to happen at the second coming of Christ. And they are, this is what the Gentiles will say. Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, 
and things wherein there is no profit. The custom, you know, think about the Hindus who have inherited the lies of Hinduism and Buddhism and all these, and, and Islam, the religion of Islam, thinking that, that if they can just kill enough Christians, they'll go to heaven, where 72 virgins await them. Just absolute lies. And they're going to realize one day that their ancestors have inherited lies. Amazing how this applies to everything today. It applies. Yeah, the word of God is still relevant to today. Because it's alive. It is alive. The Bible, the New Testament, refers to lively oracles. The Greek says living oracles, living words. Ezekiel, next book over. Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 12. I said there's going to be a Bible study, so we're going through a lot of scriptures. But you know, when you hear these scriptures, you're not hearing me, you're hearing God. That's what you came here for. So let's hear from God today. Ezekiel 11, verse 12. You know, there'd be a lot more people here today if they weren't out all doing their shopping today. Verse 12. <clears throat> and you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, like God tells us to, <clears throat> neither executed my judgments, but here's what you've done. But have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. You've done after their manners. You, you ask, well, how did they worship their gods? Look at verse, uh, look at chapter 20. By this. Yeah, yeah. That's one right there. You take that away from some kid this day. Uh, I know they live on that phone, don't they? Yeah, they live for it. Chapter 20 of Ezekiel. And the cause of it. Mm -hmm. Verse 31. Chapter 20 and verse 31. For when you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols, <coughs> even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. If you're following heathen customs, and he gives one example here. What does it mean by pass through the fire? You know, that's a that's a good question. What does it mean to pass through the fire? There have been various ideas about that. It could mean that they actually had fire and they made the, the children actually walk through it and, and get burned up. There are, there are some other ideas as to where the fire didn't for, actually. For what reason? Uh, <clears throat> originally, it was in honor of Molech, I think. Okay. But now they're doing it. See, well, it, it worked for them. Yeah, now we're doing it to the true God. He said, now you're going to inquire of me after you do this? If we learn the way of the heathen and then we try to inquire of God, he says, I won't be inquired of you. If you worship God the way the heathen does and then you come and pray, I wonder why God doesn't hear my prayers. He said, I'm not going to be inquired by you. Boy, that's this is serious. How strict is God about our worship? It sounds to me like he's pretty strict. Now, let's go to the New Testament, and I want to show you two scriptures here in the New Testament. Matthew 6. Did Jesus believe the same way? He was the God of the Old Testament, as we proved from Lesson 4 at the Prove All Things course. He was the God of the Old Testament. Matthew 6, and we'll start in verse 7. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Verse 8, the first line. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Don't be like the heathen. Our whole church world says, well, but, but now you see, today that's how we do it. Okay, that makes it right. We've evolved. Yeah, we've evolved. We've developed. We've improved on this. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, live by every word of God, not traditions of the church. The Old yeah, there are people who say we don't follow the Old Testament anymore. Look at Mark chapter 7. Next book over. Mark chapter 7. Starting in verse 7. How bid in vain do they worship me? Now, who worships Jesus? Well, we do. Christians, not the Buddhists, the Hindus, not even the Jews, the Christians worship Jesus. How be it in vain do they worship me? Why? Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God. Remember I told you how I, these guys asked me, could we please do such and such? Please, please, please let us do this other thing. I said, oh, okay. And then they couldn't do what I told them to do. They wouldn't do it. I, 
They, they said, we don't have time to do that now. So they didn't have time to do the job they're getting paid for. Hmm? It's your fault. Yeah, yeah, it's my fault. <clears throat> I know it. So Jesus said, you've laid aside the commandment of God so that you can hold your own tradition. Verse 9, full well you reject the commandment of God that, meaning for this purpose, that you may keep your own tradition. And then he quotes one of the God's commandments. And he says, but now this is what God said, but now you say the other thing. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So if we use tradition in place of God's commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Then we wonder. Yeah, and we wonder how come our prayers aren't answered. Exactly. God said, I won't be inquired of you. Or anything else for that matter. Yeah. Now I'm going to read from this book here, a book by Dave Hunt. A Woman Rides the Beast. It's about Revelation 17, the harlot that sits on the beast. Daniel tells us there are four beasts, and all commentaries tell you, including the Roman Catholic Church, that the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. So and they also tell you, in the Pope Pius edition of the Dalway Rooms Catholic Bible, they tell you that the woman, I mean, not the woman, but the beast in Revelation 17 is the Roman Empire. Well, then who's the woman sitting atop the beast? Because in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. Who is this woman that rides the beast? Dave Hunt says, the Roman Catholic Church and the last days. This book here is uh, well over 500 pages. I recommend you get a copy of it. It's a lot to read. I'm going to read you just a few pages out of this book here. On page 80. The, the, the offerings and all that that we give up to him is a stench. Yeah. Unless we're worshiping him. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they'd offer up animal sacrifices, but then they did it their way. In fact, in Ezekiel 8, I didn't read that. They went out to the temple, um, uh, <clears throat> apparently in springtime. They had their backs to the temple, the temple of God, to worship the true God, but they had their faces to the sun in the east. When is the sun directly in the east? At sunrise. And they were having a worship service at sunrise. Where do you, and and they were and the women were weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was the Babylonian god who had died and been resurrected. You see the connection? The Catholic Church brought that same worship in. Now, on uh, in his chapter is City on Seven Hills. Listen to what he says. The subtitle: More blood than the pagans. Pagan Rome made sport of throwing to the lions, burning and otherwise killing thousands of Christians, and not a few Jews. Yet, quote Christian, unquote Rome. <laughs> slaughtered many times that number. Christian Rome killed many times more than the pagan Rome had killed of Christians and Jews. Beside those victims of the Inquisition, there were the Huguenots, Albigenses, and Waldenses. These were, these were Sabbath-keeping Christians in the Middle Ages. And other Christians were massacred, tortured, and burned at the stake by the hundreds of thousands simply because they refused to align themselves with the Roman Catholic Church and its corruption and heretical dogmas. Protestants have now forgotten the hundreds of thousands of people burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church. How do they do that? They just, they don't. Well, the Protestants are now getting buddy-buddy with Rome now. They've forgotten these things. For and These people were burned at the stake for embracing the simple gospel of Christ and refusing to bow to papal authority. Amazingly, Protestants are now embracing Rome as Christian while she insists that the separated brethren, while she, Rome, insists that their separated brethren, meaning Protestants, be reconciled to her on her unchangeable terms. The Pope has said we need all the Protestants to come back to their mother, and then the Pope wants to dominate people. Many evangelical leaders are intent upon working with Roman Catholics to evangelize the world. <clears throat> They don't want to hear of any negative, quote-unquote, reminders of the millions of people tortured and slain by the Roman church to which they now pay homage or the fact that Rome has a false gospel of sacramental works. Christian, quote-unquote, Rome slaughtered Jews by the thousands far more than pagan Rome ever did. With the cross on their shields and armor, the Crusaders massacred Jews across Europe on their way to the Holy Land. Almost their first act upon taking Jerusalem for, quote, Holy Mother Church, unquote, was to herd all of the Jews into the synagogue and set it ablaze. Good Christian people, these Catholics. 
nor can the Vatican escape considerable responsibility for the Nazi Holocaust. Had the Pope, Pope Pius XII, protested, as representatives of Jewish organizations and the Allied powers begged him to do, he would have condemned his own church. Now, we'll do that. exactly. Now listen to this. In 1936, Bishop Berning of Osterbruck, I can't pronounce these German words, had talked with the Fuhrer, Hitler, for over an hour. Hitler assured his lordship there was no fundamental difference between National Socialism and Nazism and the Catholic Church. Had not the Church, he argued, looked on Jews as parasites and shut them in ghettos? I am doing, he boasted, what the Church, I am only doing, he boasted, what the Church has done for 1,500 years only more effectively. Being a Catholic himself, he told Burning he admired and wanted to promote Christianity. The Catholic Church said nothing when the Holocaust occurred. I've got a book at home that's that thick called Hitler's Pope. And it's a book Pope about this Pope here. <clears throat> a few more pages here. There is no other city in the history of which it's been true, and such is still the case today. The kings, a city that rules over the kings of the earth, only one city can make that boast, and that's Rome. Only of the Vatican could it be said that a city reigns over the kings of the earth. Vatican City is absolutely unique. <clears throat> he mentions the connection to ancient Babylon, which the Vatican has maintained down through history, and the paganized Christianity it has promulgated. One 18th century historian counted 95 popes who claimed to have had divine power to depose kings and emperors. Historian Walter James wrote that Pope Innocent III, who started the Inquisition to kill Christians, held all Europe in his net. Gregory IX thundered that the Pope was Lord and Master of everyone and everything. The Popes reigned over kings as an undisputed fact of history. Pope Nicholas declared, We Popes alone have the power to bind and loose uh, and to absolve Nero and to condemn him. And Christians cannot, under penalty of excommunication, execute other judgment than ours, of which alone is infallible. And then he said, we order you in the name of religion to invade, uh, talking to one particular king, to invade his states, burn his cities, and massacre his people. That was words from Nicholas, Pope Nicholas I in the 1800s. We order you to massacre them. That is amazing. A few more quotations here about how the see Protestants came from that wretched organization that's where the Protestant church came from they are the daughters of mother Rome people don't seem to care nowadays uh, Jack Van Impey who is supposedly a Protestant uh, back in the 90s especially I used to watch his TV show in the 90s all he did was brag on how wonderful the Catholic church was and he loved the Pope oh he just adored the Pope they must have given him a lot of money for that like Mother Teresa, John, Pope, John Paul II praises all religions. Now remember, God said don't mix paganism, heathenism with the true religion. <clears throat> In 1993, the Pope, quote, called on Christians, Muslims, and animists, people who worship spirits, to respect one another's religious beliefs. And then the author here says, how can one respect beliefs that lead people to hell? Far from asking us to respect pagan beliefs, the Bible condemns it. In Togo in 1985, the Pope exulted that he had, quote, prayed for the first time with animists, people who are praying the spirits. Yes, sir. They just had news recently of how many of the popes have committed sexual immorality. Oh, he talks about that too in here. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. There was one, and I don't have the quotation written down here, but there's one place where the the women were afraid to go to St. Peter's to pray because the popes would rape them, the pope that was there. Roman Catholicism has always accommodated itself to the pagan religions. In the name of, of God. Yeah, in the name of God. If they did all of that, see, they were the pope, they could do anything. And they could do it in his name, supposedly. They have accommodated themselves to the pagan religions of those people which had, quote, Christianized, unquote. They accommodate to, to the pagan religions realm. Well, well, listen to this quotation from the nun. Sister Mary L. O'Hara, professor of philosophy at the College of St. Mary in Omaha, specializes in promoting Buddhist and Hindu techniques for enhancing education in Catholic schools. 
You can enhance their education by promoting paganism. I recommend you get this book. You'll find it quite interesting. Let's see. I think I've got just one more page, one more quotation here. There's over 500 pages in here. Now, the Virgin Mary, remember if you've read Jeremiah, God condemns the Queen of Heaven. They would make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. If you go back and study who the Queen of Heaven was, it was Semiramis originally who became um, Isis, uh, the, the Queen of Heaven. She died and went to heaven. Now she became a queen. And they would worship Isis. Osiris was her husband who was Tammuz, the sun god. Long story. But anyway, the Catholics merely took the pagan religion of the Queen of Heaven and said, let's make Mary the Queen of Heaven and all the heathen can go ahead and worship the Queen of Heaven. We'll just call it Mary now. Mary is the Queen of Heaven. We're told in Scripture that Christ is the King, but never that there is a Queen of Heaven. The only, quote, Queen of Heaven, unquote, mentioned in Scripture is an idol which was worshipped by the pagans and to which the Jewish women gave offerings, bringing the wrath of God upon them. You'll read that in Jeremiah chapter 7 about how the, the women made drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven. Far from being embarrassed by such pagan connections, Rome flaunts them. Rome flaunts these things. Now, should true Christians... And that's not even half of what we don't know about. Oh, there's so much, yeah. I mean, there's a video out on this too, and I just read a book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome by a former Catholic priest. And he talks about the horrible sex scandals that they had, and he was writing in the 1800s, in the 1880s. And he was a priest for 25 years. He was born in the Catholic Church, and uh, he eventually got out of it. He saw the light, but the priests were all scandalous. The nuns were scandalous. The, the convents where the nuns were were nothing but brothels. The priests would go in there. I mean, it was just, and some, of the, and some of the nuns even became prostitutes and were selling their bodies. But they couldn't get married. If they got married, they'd be thrown out. They could be excommunicated, but as long as they stayed single, they could sell their bodies. And I mean, this is going on in what is supposedly the true church. But now, should cr true Christians celebrate or observe and, or in any way participate in religious observances that did not come from the Bible? How Did you know I saw this on a Catholic calendar? It's now listed as a Christian holiday on the Catholic calendar, Halloween. Halloween, monsters and ghosts, demons, devils, and, and these horrible things and spooky stuff. How does that honor our Lord and Savior? And yet now it's a Christian holiday on the Roman calendar. Jesus said the traditions of men make our worship of him to be in vain. It's something we ought to prayerfully seek God about, not, not human religious leaders. Don't seek leaders. Don't say, well, let me see what Brother so-and-so had to say. No, we should go directly to the Bible, find out what the Bible says, and only, only obey what the Bible says. I hope that was helpful today. Any questions? Over? It's over. I got cheated. You've been here about an hour. Went by fast, but see, don't fall asleep when it's enjoyable. But this is, this is all God's word. And this was simply showing you how the Catholic Church have disobeyed God's word. Giving you proof of it. Any comments? Any thoughts? Now there's a holiday coming up. I think I've decided not to go over to the Catholic Church. That's good. But the Protestants are the daughter churches. They're the daughters. And there's a holiday coming up, and I won't mention the name of it, but a lot of Protestants are getting ready to celebrate it because they... Oh, they do that. <coughs> they inherited it from other rooms. Thanksgiving, they start doing that. Oh, yeah. We, no, I'll rephrase that. We start doing that. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I haven't yeah, celebrated. This is the first year that I haven't. And well, last year I didn't actually. But yeah. I haven't observed Christmas for 25 years. Yeah. It's been 40 uh, some for me. I gave it up. And I've never missed it. First of all, you know, when you think about buying all those gifts for people that you don't care about anyway, I mean, you spend a lot of money. I knew a man up in Virginia. He he had to, he didn't have the money, so but he had to buy gifts because that's the bondage of the holiday. So he had to put it all on his credit card, and he was still paying it off in March for all the gifts he'd bought. For, he had four kids. 
had a wife, who had so many people he had to buy gifts for his family. Those people expected it, Chief. Yeah, everybody expects it. So it puts you in bondage. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. And I haven't bought a Christmas card in over 40 years. I had a girl I was dating. I was very interested in here just a few years ago. And uh, I don't celebrate Valentine's Day either because if you study the origin of Valentine's Day, that goes back to the Lupercalia, which was a sex holiday. I mean, almost everything we got from the Catholic Church is pagan. So, so very nice on the phone. I explained to her, no, I don't celebrate that holiday. Well, she dropped her last boyfriend because he wouldn't buy her a Valentine's gift. And I said, I don't participate in that. Look, I'll buy you plenty of gifts. I'm just not going to buy you one based on this particular one. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, February is the dead of winter. A, a young man's fancy turns to love in springtime, not the dead of winter. Yeah. Valentine's Day, if it was really, truly a, a romance day, it ought to be in late March. The one yeah. spring. Yeah. But... In the dead of winter, good grief! But anyway, uh, if you know it, when Jesus comes back, we're all all nations will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll read that in Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 19. We're not going to be celebrating these holidays of, of Rome. I uh, <clears throat> I don't have um, the phone to answer anybody's questions who's watching online, but I'll check them later and try to get back and just send you an email and answer your questions later. We're dismissed. God bless you. We'll see y'all next time.